Right, is anyone able to confirm that we've got audio? Yes, good audio, thank you. Ah, oh, thanks very much, Julie, good. Good, okay, let's get, well, let's get cracking. Um, I've got the record button going, so we, and we can get straight into it. Now, um, this week, please, can I urge you to, as much as possible, um, jump in and ask the questions you need. Um, this is our last opportunity to, to talk about this before the assessment's due next week, at the end of week five. Um, so please, let's, let's have a really good discussion about it and we'll get this posted. Um, I'll put up the lecture on assessment um, probably tomorrow, so it's up there in plenty of time, um, to enable you to have a look at the final week um, and consider those issues related to assessment so that you can actually get them posted. All right, let's get going. Um, so I've been looking at the forums for this week and, um, and also fielding a lot of individual emails from people. So can I encourage you please to use the forums because that way you're, you know, if you're thinking about it and concerned about it, there's bound to be a lot of other people. Um, so when we're looking at the forums, um, a lot of them are starting to talk about the lesson sequence. And bear in mind, it's not a lesson plan, it's a lesson sequence. And so I'm gonna talk about a model for doing that here today, just to help guide you in that. So in this sequence, just ask yourself what level of experience, some of the things you need to think about um, as you're preparing it, what level of experience students have had in planning and conducting investigations and working collaboratively. Okay, so you're gonna to need to build in a, a little scaffold in a task there. And also look at the diversity of backgrounds because we are talking here about differentiation, um, the differing abilities and learning styles, students with any, any students with special needs that you may be thinking in your group, um, and students for whom English is an, an additional language. Um, uh, you know, these people do exist and they can create um, amendments that, to your, your lesson sequence. And do you need to modify and adapt your lessons uh, where possible for, to deal with any literacy issues? Um, and you know, that can, that can happen uh, quite significantly in science classes. Um, do you have to scaffold any tasks further for particular students? Um, you know, we talked in, in past sessions about the sage on the stage, you know, the meddler in the middle and, and the guide on the side. Um, that's a scaffolding strategy. You start at the beginning of the class, then you move to work around groups as the meddler, and finally the guide at the side, just sitting with your, your problem students, you know, that the, the bottom of the bell curve, the ones who are never going to get it. Um, and your goal is to get them to that minimum threshold every lesson. So, um, you know, we've got those three models for scaffolding. Do you need to provide additional elaborations and demonstrations? So, you know, are, do you have a group of students that you're going to need to pull together and actually, you know, deconstruct the task even more for them? And are you going to provide additional extensions and options for gifted and talented students? So, you know, all of these things are things that you need to consider in your lesson sequence um, because you're writing it as a professional lesson sequence. So you're, you're actually giving tips to other teachers. You're, you're, you know, giving information about resources. You're talking about equipment. You're making the whole thing absolutely explicit. So when we look at this, you are actually talking about the three-step inquiry process in your lesson sequence. Now, someone said to me in the forums, how many lessons is that? Is that five? I want to do five, one for each of the E's. I mean, that's nice and succinct, but bear in mind, um, you know, when you're, when you're doing your student activity, it, you may get that done in one lesson or in a one-hour period. Um, and then you, you, your discussion may form the second part of the lesson. And from there, you, you may set up an investigation for the students to do as extension. So, you know, think about your lesson sequence. Um, you can take one lesson for each of the E's and do it very systematically and, and chunky like that. Or you can basically set up an introductory task where you do your diagnostic assessment, your case study stuff. And from there you can move through and do your, your activity where they do their investigations um, and ultimately an investigation where they come up and create a, a rule and a fair test that they can explore. Um, as extension tasks to that and, you know, incorporating discussion around that. So it's very loose as to how your lesson sequence is going to go. Um, it's open, it's open. But there should be three explicit steps, clearly, in your inquiry process. And so for each activity, um, have you considered lesson outcomes and descriptions? Equipment lists and the steps in the lesson. You know, are they explicit? So when your lesson sequence gets posted and put up and then your assessment submitted, can I look at it and see those three things? Are they explicit? Do you need to include information about students' existing ideas? So are you putting up an idea or a task? Now, do you need to justify why you're doing that by putting up students' existing ideas? Is there any key vocabulary? Is there any hints for teaching the activity? Teacher content information, is there something teachers need to know? And are there follow-up up activities, for instance, where you, you may do an, an exploration or you may do a diagnostic task and then you may set a follow-up activity up just to reinforce what happened in that particular task. So think about these steps. I'm not saying every lesson sequence has to include them, but just make sure you're thinking about them as you're preparing your lesson sequence because I'm getting a lot of questions about what should I put in, what should I not put in. What you should put in is consideration. 
of as many of these variables as you need to include. You know, these are fairly explicit. We need to see those. Um, the activity sequences, the outcomes, the equipment lists and listen steps. Um, this is, you know, it's going to add further light. It's going to shed further light on what you're doing in your science lesson for other teachers to replicate and follow. Any questions or comments about that? <clears throat> Make reasonable sense? And I'm sure people are doing that, which is good. Um, here's an example. I mean, I've just taken one straight from the, um, the science by doing. They, they do it beautifully. So if you need a model, Here's, here's a really good example of, of how they do it. Notice they've got a little, little subheading there, before you teach. And, you know, they basically say, this is what you've got to do to set, set this task up. So prior knowledge and understanding of science processes. Um, and for instance, you know, they, a lot of notebooking um, in, in science by doing. Um, and the philosophy there is from Dennis Goodrum is that, you, you, you know, most scientists actually have a, work, uh, a notebook. Um, and that's absolutely true. I mean, when you're teaching, you walk around basically with your, book, your notebook or your, your laptop attached to your, your hip. So it's pretty much a, a requirement. You can see down here, they've got the key vocabulary. So all the things that you need to cover as a teacher or you know, and you're actually gonna have to ram home in your introductory task. The equipment list. Okay, in this case, you know, it's, it's actually driven by media, this particular activity. So it's a diagnostic one. Um, they're actually using cartoons to tease out um, student understandings and things to consider and hints for success. As you can see, some, some hints to teachers here and some further references and investigations. So this is a really good example of how to set up your lesson sequence so that, you know, Blind Freddy can actually follow it. Yeah, and that's the whole goal. And if Blind Freddy uh, can follow it, then clearly it's going to be very easy for your markers to assess. Diagnostic assessment is really critical in, in your introductory task when you're, you're doing your lesson sequence. Now, um, I've had a couple of questions in the forum about assessment. We'll cover that in next week's lecture. I'll put, up, put that up before the end of this week so you've got plenty of time to look at it. Um, but basically, there's three, three steps in assessment just this, that we're looking for in this lesson sequence. There'll be the diagnostic one, which of course is your case study. Then there's going to be formative assessment, which is the things that you do throughout the investigation or the activity that you're doing, the inquiry activity. And then ultimately, some type of formative, a summative assessment, that is a final culminating task that you're going to use to measure people's understanding. Okay, so they're the three things we're going to look at. And you can see here again from the, um, you know, the science by doing, they've got teacher content information. So is anybody writing theirs at this stage uh, as if though they're writing it to another teacher to deliver? Yep, good. A couple of people, yep. Okay. I have been, yes, yes. It, really important to do that because it makes everything explicit. You know, if you've got an imagined audience there who is a colleague or a peer, then you're writing to that person. So you're teaching them how to teach it. And that's exactly what this assessment requires. So as you teach, you can see they actually break it down into steps to science by doing, um, and little activities. Ask the students what they feel about these claims when they're looking at teeth. This, this is myth busting basically, which is always a good activity to do um, when you get into um, science, you know, you know, when you, you can actually pose a myth. And then of course the fair test is, as we know, a la myth busters, um, that they actually then go and explore the, the actual science behind it. Step one, step two, actually lays it out quite explicitly, step three and step four. And then as you can see here, follow up, really important. Okay, so you've got something up your sleeve. So as you go through and work with your different groups, you start as the sage on the stage, you then move to the meddler in the middle. And then step three, you know, you're, you're looking at getting around here, sitting with students on the guide on the side, going through and working with that, that, you know, that differentiated group of students that you've got. If some students finish early, okay, have a couple of tasks up your sleeve. And those tasks, again, need to be relevant. They need to be in the context because you don't want to stop teaching this lesson just to start teaching this one, the follow-up lesson. So they've got to be extension topics, okay? And they've also got to be short so that they can be done for people who finish the task quickly. Or they can also be set for homework if you're at a school or in a program that uses homework. Fairly straightforward, so I won't spend too much time on that. Please, some questions. This is, you know, this is not meant to be a one-to-one, a -one, um, you know, one-to-many discussion. It's actually meant to be a collaborative. So, you know, I don't want to make it too easy for you. Please throw in any questions and comments you may have. Embedding assessment is our week five um, lecture. 
um, and we're going to talk about that um, diagnostic assessment. So here's a couple of, I know some of you are working on this pretty heavily now, um, to include these things in your assessment um, regimes. So it has to be explicit. So diagnostic assessment, really that is where you're doing your introductory task. You're sitting down with your learners in the case study and you're actually teasing out this concept or this misconception. Um, formative assessment. Here's what's happening. The meddler in the middle, you're providing feedback to students during the unit about their level of understanding of the concepts. And you know, science by doing use notebooks here. And you know, I'm a big believer in notebooks or some people use worksheets. Worksheets can get lost. Um, you know, I actually think notebooks are fabulous because you say to students, okay, grab your notebook and instantly there's a cognitive shift. You know, it's a little mnemonic. It's like a string around their finger saying, ah, science, notebook, there's a connection. You know, and if you can establish that connection, it's a little, little Pavlovian. I mean, you're not going to have them salivating, but you are going to have them making that connection. So, oh, it's science time. Where's my notebook? I say, and get them to, you know, structure their notebook, give them guidelines on how to do it. And it's also wonderful to show the notebooks to parents when they come on, on parent-teacher night. Okay, or parent teacher day or parent interviews, or if you actually do use portfolio based assessment. And you know, I'd encourage a few of you to think about that. Um, portfolio based assessment is where you sit down and you actually have interviews with your students, you schedule interviews throughout a term, um, and you sit down and talk to them about the, the, their ongoing continuous work. So, notebooks are fabulous for that. You can actually get them to go through their, their notebooks, and it's a little bit like stimulated recall in the interview where you're actually verbally assessing and interviewing the student about their, their knowledge, knowledge of science as it grows and develops. And therefore it's both diagnostic and formative and can also be in a portfolio system, um, it can also be summative. So please know the difference. Diagnostic is what the teacher does to justify what they're doing, their, their, their lesson content. Um, there's no point teaching something students know. So if you teach it and they know three quarters of it, then you've then got to go back and redo the 25%. Formative assessment is the assessment you do along the way. And summative assessment is your culminating task. And you may, for instance, go through an inquiry-based activity and then set students an investigation of their own, which you will then use for assessment. So that's your summative task. So we expect those to be quite explicit as you're, um, you're going through doing this assessment. Why investigate? One of the forum questions this week is, do I have to do a fair, fair test? Um, no, you don't. And at the end of this session, I'll talk about some other strategies. Um, you know, different to a fair test, um, where you can actually go about uh, you know, measuring and evaluating claims, um, um, the relevance of student claims and un learner understandings. Um, but a couple of reasons why, I mean, investigations are really, you know, they're, they're out there. Um, they're explicit and, you know, they inform, you know, the scientific process, what we call scientific thinking or modeling. Um, and a lot of people critique, critique scientific modeling you know, in, on the basis that it, it lacks soul, that it's very robotic. Um, but, you know, it, that's the role of the teacher. You know, that's the role of the five E's model is to actually engage students with the questions. And yeah, scientific questions can be robotic. They can be dull. They can be, you know, lack feeling. Um, but at the same time, if the teacher's passionate and the context is relevant, then, you know, um, the scientific method will, will provide a really good inquiry framework. So you create your questions, your hypotheses, they're explicit. And then the reason why you know, we, we do use the scientific method a lot is because you can actually see what's happening with the students at back at the questioning stage. If their questions are wrong, then that's when the meddler in the middle intervenes and sort of says, you know, what do you think you're going to get from that? Okay, your hypothesis. Does that actually explore the, the variables here? You know, you're, you're changing two variables. How is that going to help you understand the outcome? You know, the, the meddler in the middle can actually jump in here and, and, you know, work with the students before they get it wrong or before they, they deviate. Um, it also helps with the gathering, gathering relevant data, um, accurate measurement, um, repetition is really important. Um, and, you know, we all know generalizability and, and rec rec replicability are two of the criteria of the positive model. So um, positivism says it's everything you do has got to be generalizable and generalizable, and it's got to be replicable by an, another scientist. You can also use the scientific method to explain and summarize patterns in data. And, you know, that's really important because here we're talking about, you know, some of the science strands. We know that we've got science understandings. We know the content, but the science inquiries and science as a human endeavor, the nature of science in particular, um, we do need to understand and, and explain and summarize patterns in data. And that's Excuse critical. Me, Colin. I'm sorry. Uh, just, just talking about the whole science in, uh, in, in their lives and stuff. Like when I did my, um, 
research and a little survey with the kids, I was really interested that it was prep to grade three and none of them could tell me how they use science in their, in their real life. Not a single one out of 10. Oh, that's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. Did, did you help them reframe that and, and show them that in fact they do? Uh, well, I wasn't too sure at the time. I was just kind of trying to get, gather, you know, like some information to see where, which misconception I wanted to head off in the direction. And then I've got five kids. I'm going to work a little bit, but I want to go a bit deeper with, I feel like I've just left it all really too late because I'm a bit scared of science, but, um, I think I am going to, yeah, try and work with that because it was just so fascinating. And, and in movies, I said, have you seen science in any movies? thinking they'd come up with something. And I think one kid said Back to the Future, he was the grade three kid. So, yeah, interesting, I thought. Yes, it is interesting, isn't it? And when we talk about follow-up activities, you know, when at the early stage of, of your, um, your, your um, lesson sequence, um, you know, it's really good to sit down and explore, you know, what they know about science or a particular science concept. And then the follow-up activities can actually just extend that to other science concepts. And so they actually get to, you know, to tease through their understandings and their applications of science. That's, that's really fascinating. And I think um, once we demystify it, you know, it, it's, it's really important. And we talked very much in the early part of this course about the role of language in, in actually mystifying things um, and, you know, and, and language in, in sort of creating misconceptions. You know, the sun rises over the hill, of course. What a misconception. Very poetic. Um, the moon sort of, you know, settles below the horizon. You know, what a what a poetic misconception that is. And we, our language just continues um, to, to breed these misconceptions. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's evidence behind that. I mean, if you actually Google, and a little test for you, Google the Flat Earth Society, and you'll see that this Flat Earth Society actually does exist. So, you know, you can actually get that as an investigation going with your students. Um, and that fits very much into the physical sciences framework too, where you can actually look at, you know, planets and, and, and um, environments and, and shapes and, and you know, suitability and adaptability. And um, the Flat Earth Society is still a very active group. They've got their own website and, and um, you know, they're, they're contesting. That's just crazy. Flat Earth Society, no idea. Yeah, Google them and find out. Yeah, yeah wow, interesting. Yeah. Well, I ended up choosing with the kids, uh, like uh, the misconception that sugar melts in water and disappears. Nice. Um, nearly all of them came up with that. But, yeah, that's where I'm kind of struggling at the moment is trying to fit it in. There's two sort of content descriptors I thought it might fit under, and that was in one for year two and one for year three. But it doesn't fit neatly into either one of those. So I'm a bit worried about that. But I don't want to take up everyone's time with that today. No, look, don't worry about that. I mean, if, if, if you found a relevant um, elaboration, um, yeah, okay, you've got your strand and within that strand sits an, a relevant elaboration. We'll talk about this a little bit later. I've got a few examples to show you. Um, don't panic because you can then go from your science understanding strand and you can then go straight into your science investigations and your, your science as a human endeavour strands and you can pluck multiple um, elaborations from there to justify what you're doing in any science understanding. So, you know, you, whatever you do as a teacher here, you're going to be grounded in the ACS. It would be lovely if your misconception lines up with your age groups. What if you've got a multi-age group? And that's the reason why I put on um, um, Mark Weatherall, some little video on, on the uh, uh, web content lecture this week, because he talks about the ACS being themed. So it's really not that important that we have science understanding um, as tied to a particular age group, it's tied to a particular point in the curriculum. I mean, how ridiculous is that? It's a theme, okay? And that theme can be stretched across a group of learners and it can be investigated through science inquiries and it can be, you know, made relevant through, through um, science and human endeavours um, through yeah, each of the pretty, elaborations, yeah. Sorry, Colin, that's also important too because I've noticed in my own area where I'm from, I saw a thing on Facebook yesterday where the Steiner schools are starting to pop up more, where they're actually combined groups. Yeah. Yeah, you, you'll find that a lot. I mean, and a lot of um, Queensland state schools, for instance, are moving towards that um, multi-age model too, um, where they're having a couple of classes where they're, they're actually putting together um, quite differentiated learners. For instance, kids with disabilities, kids on the autism spectrum, um, some older kids who are, um, you know, high achievers, um, and, and also some kids with learning needs. And they're putting them all together in one class and they're using peer-based multi-age um, class uh, collaborative learning models and having great success. Um, so, you know, you may find yourself in these kinds of classrooms. So it's really important to see the ACS as a continuum. And as Mark Weatherall points out, as, as a themed continuum, you know, at, at 
foundation to year two level, we're asking what's going on here. And then by the time we get to age three, we're sort of saying, what if this changes? And, and then by the time we get, you know, up to age five and six, we're saying, well, you know, how does this operate in the broader world? You know, so you're, you're extending those themed inquiries across the years. And this is why, you know, it's, it's always good to do investigations. Investigations, as we've got on the screen at the moment, um, you know, you, you've got this common set of circumstances running through every investigation that students will do. Communication, you can see the embedding of the inquiry and the, the nature of science here too. Um, it's all quite embedded. So just, again, putting this up just to show you when you're doing your, your lesson and your elaboration, make sure you're thinking about your investigation. And here's some, some words to throw in why you're doing an investigation. You know, here's some rationale. It's a you know, really good reason to, to strategy to include. It's well grounded and it's, it's transportable. You know, you can take it from task to task and you don't have to constantly reskill your kids in, in collaborative learning to do it. You know, so it, it's, a good, it's a good framework for going forward. The elaborations, as we said here, um, you know, we're talking about this just then. Um, I've had a, a lot of questions from people about, um, and, and again and again, actually, it's a question that comes over and over. It's the number one question. Um, my elaborate or, or my misconception doesn't fit into the ACS at the level I want to teach it. Okay, no problems. No problems. Uh, or some people came up with a topic, for instance, and, and they couldn't find a, a, an elaboration to actually match their topic. Um, just go into the curriculum and have a look. You will find them. That it's the curriculum is designed to be totally flexible. You know, and it's really important that we remember that it's it's not meant to be a bite of this, a bite of that. Um, you know, this is not a siloed model of science. This is an integrated model of science. So whatever you want to teach is a misconception. The important thing is, is that your lesson sequence scaffolds it properly. If it sits outside your year level, don't panic, okay? Simply use it as a science understanding and then use your year level human endeavor and inquiry skill strands to make it relevant to your learners because these set up the nature of science issues, the inquiry skills processes where you can address any science understanding. Okay, so it's not exclusive. They actually, you know, they're taught together. They're integrated, the three strands. You know, if one of them doesn't add up, relax because these two will carry any scientific investigation. And we can see that here. Here's a little example just from foundations that I plucked out. Materials, a very popular one at foundations level. Uh, nature of science. You can see here it's got another another elaboration sitting there nicely and the standard to which it, it um, you know is commensurate. Um, observing, asking questions about and describing changes, objects and events. Okay, and that could fit a range of things. We just heard, um, I think it was uh, Susan talking about sugar or Julie talking about the sugar activity. Okay, again, changes in objects and events. Um, inquiry skills. You see here, here's four strands related purely to science inquiry. That, and the reason I've put them here is they're generalizable to every science understanding. So whatever you do, this assessment task is going to be embedded. It's going to be embedded. So you don't need to um, you know, worry too much about the, the detail of my, oh, my year level doesn't line up to my, my um, misconception. Oh, dear. Um, relax. Make it line up. Use the other two strands to make and connect the relevance. Um, that's all I wanted to say on the forums. Has anybody else got anything they want to raise before we move on and just briefly talk about the, uh, the activities for this week? No? Good. Okay. Now, as I said to, to you last week, um, I'm you know, deliberately trying to ease off on the content of these activities. Um, I'm trying to use them basically as summary activities um, so that you, you know, you're building a little mnemonic record of what you're doing. Um, Dennis Goodrum provides a really nice video there where he inter integrates some science understanding skills and endeavor to, to say, you know, it's used. It's, it's a schema. It's a framework, an integrated framework um, to answer interesting questions about us and our lives. Activity two, we looked at physics, because physics is an area that tends to freak people out. Um, you know, just relax. Physics is actually best explored from the everyday phenomena. Um, and last week, for instance, I put up some, um, some online uh, activities and examples. Um, for instance, uh, amongst those were um, John, uh, John Travoltage, I think was a nice one for static electricity. Um, we had a couple there for um, force and motion. Um, bend it like Beckham is a beauty when, when you're using uh, for how to curve a soccer ball when you kick it. Magnets are always good, you know, nice simple science. An outboard motor, Newton's third law, action and reaction. Um, and you can actually use um, you know, little plastic boats with elastic bands. Um, all sorts of things you can do. You can look at mobile phones, how they actually work. 
Um, music is a fabulous uh, area too to explore physics, sound waves. Um, and of course the microwave oven and, and electromagnetic waves if you want to get into something a little more sophisticated. But science, you know, the, the aim here is to make it an everyday activity. Um, and if we can do that with physics and science, then you know the question that Susan raised before about where she's got students and talking to them about where science appears in, appears in their lives, um, here's a couple of examples that you could throw back at them. Okay, why does your hand shock every time you get near near a car? Okay, again, build up of positive ions. So science is relevant to them, and you know that one of the wonderful things you can do is is take them through these explorations and connections. Moving on to the ACS and misconceptions, it would be lovely if your misconception lined up um, beautifully in the ACS. If it doesn't, relax because you know your science understanding is only one part of the misconception. Um, you're quite welcome to use and identify a misunderstanding. And when a teacher sees something missing in a student's framework, an obvious response is to deal with it, to teach it. So to walk away from a misconception, it doesn't matter what year level you're at, teachers can't do that. That's not teacher's work. Our work is to pick up those misconceptions and deal with them. And our warrant to do that is the science inquiry and the science as human endeavor strands. We've got lots there we can work with and any science area we can use. So I'm not saying ignore this. I'm saying make it explicit. You know, if your science, if your misunderstanding is outside your area, make it explicit that you're drawing on, you know, your, your science inquiry and your human endeavor strands to make this connection to make it relevant to your learners. And you know, a couple here that we've, we've actually used. Um, and it's interesting because I did put this table together to you know, guide people to this you know, through Scoodle and through other resources. And I'm still getting emails from people saying, oh, I want to do the moon at night, but it, I can't find where it fits in. So please, it's really important to have a look at these and, and, and watch these, these forums and, and discuss and to communicate that too with each other. Um, you know, there's a lot of people working in their own lunchbox um, at the moment in this course. Um, you know, and for the next assessment item, we're actually going to move it much more into the forums and create some collaborative work there because, um, you know, it, it is one of those that's the nature of um, the next assessment item is, is one to do a review and collaboration. So, um, and hopefully you all got the email I sent out today too about the Rockhampton um, uh, Primary uh, Connections Workshop. It's a free workshop being run at Rockhampton. Um, and it goes for two days for CQU students only. It's the last time Primary Connections are going to do this. And the only cost involved is um, $20, which covers your lunch on both days. So it's extremely well reviewed. And uh, Leone has registered. Great. I'm glad to see that. So please take up these opportunities. Not everyone can do it. Um, you know, Townsville is a fair way from Rockhampton. So students here obviously won't be doing it. But, you know, if you can get there, do. Some more misconceptions. Humans lived at the same time as dinosaurs. I actually had... Um, a question just in the email yesterday about that one, despite the fact that this information has been sitting there for students. So please do use it. All birds fly is a really wonderful misconception. And again, um, relax. Some people are forcing themselves to do chemical um, sciences and physical science strands. Great. Um, I applaud that. But you won't be penalised if you don't, because let's face it, you know, we've had four weeks of this course. Week five, your assessment's due. What we're talking about here is your, your use and understanding of curriculum processes. You know, that's what's being assessed here. So if you do biological and earth and space sciences, fine. If you do chemical and physical sciences, even better. Um, the aim is to, what we're assessing here is your, your adaption and implementation of the ACS curricula, the inquiry method, and related teaching skills. Okay, so it's really explicit. That, that's what, so relax. You are not confined just to chemical and physical sciences, but your efforts, if you do that, are you know, totally applaudable. You, you know, you've got one hand clapping at the moment. So, you know, thank you for that. Yellow is the primary colour of light. Living things are either plants or animals. You can see that really simple misunderstandings, okay, and misconceptions. Um, and we also had um, activity four was share your investigation. The forum has been very quiet on that. People obviously are focusing on their, um, their, their assessment. Um, look, I get that. No judgment, as the Buddhists say. Um, you're, you know what your own priorities are. You know what your own pressures are, and you're working towards those. So, you know, um, next, uh, uh, after week six, um, when we come back and we commence week seven, um, we are going to be using forums much more and, and moving much more in a collaborative environment. So um, by at that stage, you know, I'll be putting up some quizzes, for instance, in Moodle, and I'll also be um, attempting to get you to work, work together in peer review. So um, again, you know, try and share your investigations, try and do these um, if you can. Um, they're just wonderful. I mean, 
I would never walk into a science classroom without having tested one of these um, before I went in to do it. Um, but this one's simple and just involves three lights and some cellophane paper. Um, or if you've got a film projector, even better. The Cartesian diver, you know, fantastic. Get everyone to bring a change of clothes. I've seen that one end, end in tears. And, um, <clears throat> you know, melting chocolate is a fabulous one for the, uh, the foundation and year one kids. They just love that one. I mean, I remember one year, um, I wrote it in, in the week seven material actually about we had this wonderful experience where I went to observe a, a science teacher, a pre-service teacher in her classroom and she was melting chocolate and three of the boys decided it was fabulous if you put the chocolate buddies down down the back of your pants and let them melt between the cheeks of their bottoms. And of course, um, and, and then the girls, you know, thought it was really gross when the boys would put their hands down the back of their pants and, and pull out chocolate and lick their fingers. Um, so, you know, you had this really interesting sort of um, side My Go My ahead. grade sixes love melting chocolate too because we were looking at, at the difference between chemical and physical change and, yeah, they they absolutely loved it too. Yeah, and the chocolate... Had to stop them from trying to get it. Absolutely, Laura. And the chocolate finishes up everywhere, um, you know, and, and, of course, you, you will have your fun with it too. Um, but, you know, don't... Message here is, and we're trying to get you to do the investigations, don't go into a classroom without having tried them first. I mean, we uh, pointed to a couple last week where you could actually, you know, use some of the, the online um, simulations, um, all well and good. Um, but, you know, a simulation is not the same as actually getting chocolate down the back of your shorts. You know, it's, it's just kids aren't going to remember it in quite the same way. Alan, can I ask another question really quickly? Yes. So, if, like, so melting chocolate is a physical change, but sugar melting in water is a chemical one. It is, yes. Okay. Yep. So that's going to be what I need to sort of try and show the kids the difference between. Indeed, yeah, and look, it's always it's you know it's always fabulous if you can actually um, separate, um, you know, do the reverse process too. Okay. Yeah, I mean that, that shows you know, again how the whole question of substances change. You know, do they disappear? Um, they can actually change form and, and assume another form, liquid to gas. You know, gas back to solid. Um, there's a whole range of things you can do there. Um, Is that really tricky for that age group? It could be, yes. Yeah, that's probably getting up around the six and sevens for the okay. sort of conversion activity. Just simplify, get them like... So basically melting is when one thing changes and a chemical, which is a physical change, but a chemical change is when two things react with each other. That's an excellent description, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Now, just moving quickly on to week, uh, week five, what we're going to talk about next week is assessment and the wrap-up for assessment task number one. Now, most of you are thinking about your assessment at the moment. Um, it's great. Um, assessment is largely self-explanatory. depends on, on the nature of the investigation you're doing. Um, and the, the science by doing folk, you know, have some wonderful little um, formative assessment strategies that they list um, here. And so, again, they focus very much on, on collaborative learning. Um, envoys, um, a variation on envoys there. As, as you can see... Um, it's about another other um, inquiry um, schools call call this emissaries or or, or you know um, any term related to a representative you know that they do um, but an envoy basically is someone who represents a group and they shift and and between groups and you know ultimately the the aim is to build the the, the knowledge across the entire um, cohort of students a gallery walk was it's much more physical and tactile. Um, so, for instance, you can place tables around a room and get students just to walk. Um, and you as a teacher can walk around or, or stand at a table and as each group circulates, you can actually explore the concepts or you can rotate with each group, which is fabulous. Um, sometimes you can get a parent volunteer to come in um, or if you've got a pre-service teacher with you as a, as a classroom teacher, um, fabulous. Get, get them to travel with the group so that at each point they've got someone talking about and building the formative assessment. Learning partners, students for, uh, working uh, together and helping each other learn. Notebooking is fabulous. Um, thoughts and ideas during and after science activities, electronic and hard copy, fabulous way to do it. Um, and from there, of course, you can actually create um, wikis. And from wikis, you've got, of course, a permanent resource. You can then set research tasks. Um, the nice thing about a wiki is it's asynchronous. You know, you don't need to um, do it at the time and use it at the time. If you create a wiki, you can always send students back there for extension work. Um, it's also really good for flipping a classroom um, and you can keep the wiki live for the following year or the next time you do the activity, you've got somewhere to start. So you've got generational learning too. So notebooking, don't think strategically of a notebook. Um, notebooks are great, you know, particularly in, in state schools because access to computers are so poor in most Queensland state schools. Um, but if you do um, use a, a physical notebook, great. But, you know, think about wikis, also a great, you know, free resource. 
and peer review, um, another technique used um, where the students review each other's work. So this, this is the mostly a couple of formative models here. The diagnostic assessment, you've got covered in your case study, which is good, and you've got covered in your introductory task. Your formative assessment is you know, some strategies you can use along the way so that you're demonstrating that you're connecting and measuring student learning. And obviously, the summative assessment is the, the big finale. You know, what you're going to choose and how you're going to choose to summarise your unit. So I'll talk some more about those in the lecture this week um, and also post some resources for you to help you um, review those. Um, and most of you have decided what you're going to do already. And the important thing is the resources, just check the resources to assume that you're, you're on track and you've got a good rationale for doing what you're doing. Is there... Any other questions or comments people would like to raise at this particular point? Is anybody working on part B at this stage? I've just started uh, looking at um, what strategies I'm going to use. So I'm just doing a bit of paragraph outlining. Okay, so in this lesson, I'm going to be looking at these, like, you know, the explore and elaborate yeah. Part. So yeah, I'm just breaking down what I'm going to be looking at in each lesson and I haven't gotten to writing what's in each lesson yet. Fantastic. Yeah. Look, I mean, one great way to start this, this task off, and I used to do a lot of my, my unit planning, I'd, I'd just take the five E's model and, and I'd just write it. Each page had an E and then I'd write what I wanted to do under each of the E's and then just basically cut the bits of paper up and shift them around into sequences so that I, I then would have my, my completed, um, you know, sequence or lesson sequence. Um, in the first couple of years of your teaching, you do that. As you get um, more experienced in your teaching, of course, you, you just carry it all around in your head. All you do is you have a, a diary and it tells you what, um, what stage you should be in the curriculum. And then the rest you basically just carry in your head. So your head becomes your notebook. But not very helpful for younger teachers um, when you sit down to share your work. But certainly as an old teacher, you get to do that. Um, it's one of the luxuries of the profession. But, you know, for unit planning, I just have the five E's. I would put one of the E's on each page. I'd write down on that page all of the, the list of things I wanted to achieve for this particular lesson sequence. And then basically when I came to link it together, I'd just cut those pages up um, and shift them around and I'd create my sequence and a bit of sticky tape. And there I, I had it all blue tack. I could put it on a wall and then I could actually start writing up my lesson sequence formally. So mm -hmm. it's a nice way to do it. Yeah, that's basically how I'm structuring it. <laughs> I just got to actually, uh, I've got a couple options for activities. So I'm just trying to decide which way I want to go with it. Yeah. Yeah. And bear in mind, it's hypothetical, um, mm. you know, and, and just make a note to self on the side of your, your lesson sequence that, you know, um, alternative um, strategy, you know, and just doesn't it ha even have to be long. It can only be just a really short note um, so that, you know, when you pull this lesson out in the future and you, you use it, and that's the hope that you're doing a lesson that's going to survive the test of time and, and also be relevant to you going forward. Um, so a resource you can actually use, you know, I'm trying to do some useful assessment here, take it with you, reuse it, and, you know, just keep annotating and adapting it each time you use it. And if you get your methods right, I mean, Lauren, you know, and you're selecting strategies that you're useful uh, and, and comfortable with, then you'll just generalise those from science um, understanding to science understanding to science understanding. So you, you, you'll become a little bit rote about it, um, which is great because you just get more and more comfortable and you just get more and more engaged with the concepts you're teaching. So it's always good to get your repertoire of what we call a repertoire of practice established um, and to rework it and rework it and rework it and just get good at what you do. Um, there's no crime in that at all. Any other questions or comments at this point in time? I'll just refer you to the, the links to assessment on the subject website this week. Um, and what I've tried to do on the links to assessment this week, I've actually put a couple of videos up there that may be useful for you. Um, I've just shifted onto the screen there. And uh, they, they link directly to um, uh, the Science by Doing site. And the reason why I put them up is they're actually uh, an opportunity to watch two experienced teachers teaching an inquiry model. So if you're wondering how you're going to go with your particular um, lesson sequence, then those two little examples in the links to assessment this week, um, they're only short, they're only 15 minutes each. Um, watch one if you want, um, well worth the watch because it will just give you a little bit of confidence to imagine your, your own unit the one that you're the lesson sequence you're doing to imagine it and to bring it to life um, through through this particular assessment task. So um, if there's no other questions or comments, I'll um, hit the uh, record button, get this on YouTube and uh, make it available to you for watching. Uh, no comments? 
questions? Everyone's feeling relatively comfortable? All right, on that note then, I will say thank you and wish you all well. Uh, you particularly, Julie, I hope the week goes well for you. Good, thanks, Melinda. That's good. Okay, it's really important to know. That's feedback. I appreciate it very much. If things don't, um, of course, do change and you get stuck, please con make contact. Don't, uh, don't do it alone. Um, that's why we're here. That's why we're doing a course of study to learn from each other. So please, no questions, a silly question. And thank you all and, and see you next week.